So it'll fuse. Yeah, that's yeah. the magic of ankylosis and spondylitis. Thank you, Ravi. Great presentation. Nice things. Uh, Dr. Shapla, any comment on this before I introduce you? And we obviously look forward to your talk. Uh, my, uh, my, my thoughts would be, uh, I like the idea of the percutaneous just stabilization while the, uh, while the fracture heals, but that would be, uh, that would be my major thought on this. So Dr. Shopper, it's great to have you here. Uh, welcome to Seattle. Thank you for joining us from the Southern California Orthopedic Institute from Bakersfield. Uh, by uh, means of introduction, he's a graduate medical engineer from the University of Wisconsin College of Engineering, and he went to medical school there as well, a great school. Uh, and he does orthopedic residency, and this will make Dr. Oskuyan smile. His orthopedic residency at UCLA, drum roll, sorry, Puria. And he did a fellowship at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. We had a common place there. I was there also, Dr. Uh, Shopper. And he's been in practice in LA since 1989. And we've, in this month, focused on bone healing, and we've had other companies and uh, investigators talk about some approaches towards bone healing. Uh, you have a very different angle that you're going to present, and we want to thank you for taking the time to talk about bone healing from a different perspective, and your sage advice was much appreciated during our cases, so look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if I can get my slide. Uh, hold on. Oh my gosh, this is the wrong talk. Hold on a second. I don't know how this happened. Um, <laughs> There we go. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chapman, for your kind introduction. And thank you to the Seattle Science Foundation and the Swedish Neuroscience Institute for allowing me to talk today. Uh, thanks also to Ashley Martin for helping me set this up. Uh, it was a very impressive conference. I was uh, struck by the difficulty of the cases that you uh, presented and the challenge that they posed to us. Uh, I am uh, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. We're, we're a major uh, organization in Southern California with, uh, with 29, uh, sorry, 39 physicians, six spine surgeons. We have six offices around Southern California with four big centers with uh, MRI, physical therapy, and ASC uh, incorporated. Um, we have uh, a, a pretty widely respected group, uh, and uh, we're uh, happy to uh, uh, show uh, re, uh, show some of my uh, work with uh, ordinary uh, bone grafting and bone graft supplement materials. Uh, as uh, you point out, Dr. Chapman, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon and an engineer, so I'm more of a bone mechanic than a, than a biological specialist, but I have been through a lot of different uh, graft materials that I've used for my work throughout the years, and I'm going to talk a little about um, um, the, uh, the product that I'm using from uh, Organogenesis Company. Uh, but first, a word about Bakersfield. Bakersfield is where I am located and where our practice is. This is a city in the Central Valley of California, sometimes referred to as the Paris of California. Uh, it, we are responsible for every baby carrot that you ever see in a grocery store. They all come from Bakersfield. And uh, we also have uh, oil and petroleum industry here as our main uh, economic uh, supports in this uh, community. Um, the, what I'm gonna talk to you today about is two products uh, from the uh, Organogenesis Company. I do a little speaking for them. This, the first thing I'm gonna talk to you about is something called New Shield, which is an adhesion barrier. And Dr. it's- Dr. Can you yes. share your screen? We, we have a nice view of you. You're very photogenic. You, you come across as a great spokesperson. Are you gonna share? Oh, gosh. You know? Uh, hold on, you don't see my screen. I'm sorry. Oh, I knew this was going to happen. Um, you advised me that there's a share screen. Yes, now. I have to. I have to um, get to that. Thank you for interrupting me. I'm sorry about the. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry about the, this. Uh... It happened to me. I was uh, giving a lecture this last uh, weekend. And the hosts were too polite to tell me that I was not sharing my screen. That's what I looked at my mug for way too long. I'm sorry about that. Um, oh my gosh, this is this is what's on your calendar. It's St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> and happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. This is what's known in my office as the Shopler effect because um, uh, if it has a computer to do, I, I have trouble with it. Um, 
Sharing is pause, bring your screen to the front, okay. Resume share. And he's, you're seeing no slides, correct? No slides at this point in time. Can you try resharing the PowerPoint again? We see Bakersfield, a slide of Bakersfield. We're making- Oh, the carrots, you got the carrots? Yep. See the okay. carrots? My slide talk, okay, hold on a second. Uh, I've got the slideshow, bottom right of the upper menu there. task. Go a little bit lower with your cursor. Are there's we on your task bar? Oh. Yeah, I see that. And there's a slide thing, a slide icon, slideshow icon. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. And you advance yourself, bottom left hand corner. There's a new task bar in the slide field. Correct. Oh, man. You're not seeing a picture of baby carrots, I take it. You see the carrots, we have a nice slide picture, and you advance bottom left-hand side. Right, okay, so you got the carrots. <laughs> the carrots. All right. Thank you. So anyway, I'm sorry about the uh, technical issue. There, okay. So I was telling you about, a little about Bakersfield and um, our orthopedic group. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, these products from Organogenesis. I use the New Shield Adhesion Barrier and the New Cell Bone Graft Substitute. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, here's my uh, disclaimer. Um, I've been working with Organogenesis for a little more than 10 years, and uh, I've used their New Cell Amniotic Stem Cell Suspension as an augmentation of my bone grafting procedure, as well as their demineralized bone matrix. And I've done uh, several cases with the new shield, which is this uh, uh, fibro anti-fibrotic uh, membrane formation. Uh, just to confirm, you're seeing my slides now. Is that correct? Yes, we're good. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, a few words about new shield. It's a it's a uh, uh, amniotic membrane uh, that's been uh, treated. As, it's acellular material. It has um, it's it's dehydrated. It comes out as a, as a sheet. Uh, it comes in various sizes. Most people have used it for hand and abdominal uh, surgery, but I find it, it has done a good job for me in uh, ad adhesion prevention in the spine. Here's a uh, piece from the laboratory work that the uh, organogenesis people have done. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, clinical studies on this kind of material. The number of cases that you'd have to do to uh, to uh, uh, find uh, clinical uh, relevance with uh, take backs in the operating room is, is small enough that it's gonna be hard to have a good clinical study on this. Uh, it, it's an acellular amniotic membrane, acts as an adhesion barrier. And uh, here's, uh, I use it in microdiscectomy and laminectomy cases, and particularly cases where I think I might be returning to the OR in the future such as a young, vigorous person with an L4-5 microdiscectomy, they have about a 15% chance of recurrence. So I'm gonna probably apply that uh, new shield in those cases. Here's a typical uh, view through the microscope of the dura for a microdiscectomy. Um, to use this product, I use the nerve root retractor as sort of a measuring stick to see how big of a defect I'm going to fill with the with the membrane, then I cut it to size with the scissors and apply it. Here I am using the nerve root retractor as the measuring stick to determine the size of the material. And we've cut it with the scissors, as you see on this photograph. And you apply it into the uh, laminar defect onto the dura with a pair of forceps, pretty simple. Uh, it, the, the hardest thing about it is it's very hydrophilic, and so you have to use dry instruments and have a dry field because that material will adhere instantly to almost anything that's got moisture on it. So if you're using wet uh, uh, surgical tools, it will stick to those. The other product I'm going to comment on is called New Cell. It's an amniotic uh, uh, stem cell suspension that I add to my bone grafts. Uh, it's uh, taken from uh, childbirth uh, and from the same donor. It uh, consists of some uh, extracellular matrix particles, amniotic stem cells, and has uh, various sizes. I typically use the smaller, smallest two sizes. Um, 
when you're talking about bone graft substitutes, one of the problems in our literature is that there's hundreds and hundreds of these available. And so we don't have clinical evidence studies to demonstrate the superiority of one product over another. And I'm not here to give you any such studies. I, don't, I wish I had the evidence to discuss, but I don't. Uh, this uh, it was from uh, a study from Louisiana by uh, Pierce Nunley, who did some preliminary work studying this and found it useful. Um, my typical bone graft substitute that I use for my fusions, which are almost all interbody fusions, are uh, this new cell material, uh, some demineralized bone matrix, and a bone marrow aspirate that we take from the surgical field. Here's the uh, DBM in the jar on the left and the amniotic stem cell uh, preparation. Uh, remember in your bone grafting, you wanna have an osteoconductive element, an osteoinductive element, and an osteogenic element. In here, we're using the conductive and inductive material is the DBM. The osteogenic material are the amniotic stem cells and the bone marrow aspirate. As I say, I've been in, I'm in private practice. I've been in practice for 34 years and I've used all of these products plus a few other ones that uh, uh, I, I don't even remember. Uh, the most experience I had of all of these is with, uh, is with BMP. And earlier in your conference, I described some of my travails with BMP. It's, it's pretty much out of my uh, toolbox at this point because of all the side effects that I've personally seen from it. But uh, I, I know that it has some value and uh, I'd like to see the BMP somehow refined to eliminate some of the big side effects that it has. If, it, if there's a BMP 2.0 coming out, I'd be very interested to look at it. But in any event, my standard sort of single level lumbar fusion is this uh, bilateral T lift with a Smith-Peterson osteotomy incorporated into it. We call it a spot lift. It involves a, instead of doing a standard T lift where you put in one cage, this is a bilateral T lift where you put in two cages, one on the right, one on the left. And it also involves a bilateral facetectomy and bilateral uh, 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 discectomy uh, with pedicle screw fixation. Uh, the, I like this procedure as an alternative to A-lift surgery. It is a minimally invasive procedure. It allows you to get a nice lordotic reconstruction, re reconstruction of the disc height, reduction of spondylolisthesis. And because you're taking the disc out from both sides and removing the uh, facets, you get a very large uh, interbody space to pack your graft into. And then the graft uh, supplements your fixation by providing granular mechanics. So when it's loaded in compression, it stiffens up just like packing a snowball would do. Here's a Good example of a case where I would use this procedure. Here's a, a, a spondylolisthesis with some associated scoliosis, but the patient's major complaint is, a, is due to the spondylolisthesis. You see the MRI showing the, how the spondy reduces when the patient's supine in the gantry of the MRI machine. You can see uh, uh, vacuum disc and uh, spondylolytic defects of the PARs. Um, currently, I'm using the uh, pro axis table, but when I did this case, we were using the uh, Wilson frame in a more standard manner. I, when I do these, I like to flatten out the lower doses to get started, and then we'll restore the lower doses as we close the Smith-Peterson osteotomy. You'll see that in a minute. Um, uh, I am now using the uh, Globus uh, Ex Excelsius GPS robotic system for placing these percutaneous pedicle screws, but when I started this procedure, we were doing all the pedicle screws under fluoroscopy. So first I would map out the pedicles on the patient's skin, as you see here using the C-arm, then place percutaneous pedicle screws through uh, limited incisions. We take the bone marrow aspirate from the pedicles as we're cannulating the pedicles with the Jamshidi needle and the bone marrow aspirate is withdrawn and, and set aside on the back table. Next, we have two exposures, one on the right, one on the left. And what you see there after we apply our uh, distraction retractors is the facet joint. 
Uh, we take out the facet. I've been using this uh, Mysonics ultrasonic bone scalpel. It's a very nice tool for uh, excising the facets. You block them out, basically take them out as an end block resection of the facets. Also allows you uh, decompression of the lateral recess. And then through the, uh, now you've created a transforaminal approach to the disc. You take out the facets, you have a transforaminal approach to the disc and you can do a bilateral discectomy. And when you do a bilateral discectomy, you're able to withdraw a large portion of the disc material and you know that you've got the disc material fully excised when you can create this kind of effect where you squirt the uh, uh, irrigant in from one side and aspirate it from another. And so at that point, I know I've got a pretty good discectomy at the index level. And now we set up to do the reconstruction. Here's the uh, cages that we're gonna put in. I'm using titanium expandable cages. And here is the bone graft substitute with the new cell and bone marrow aspirate combined. The uh, cages go in under fluoroscopy. We put two cages in, one from the right, one from the left. That's the view from the head of the table. You can see how the, the angle of approach to those, uh, to those cages is. They tend to converge a little bit in the midline or go in parallel. And you see on the image intensifier that we've got two cages with uh, congruent overlying shadows in the lateral view. Now you've got the cages in place, you wanna restore lordosis. So we deflex the table and compress the pedicle screws to create a nice lordotic reconstruction. And after that, you can expand these expandable titanium cages. It looks like this in its expanded state. You can see uh, the right-hand picture is the expanded, expanded state. You can see the cages expanding and then add, sorry, then add, um, then add um, lordotic uh, fixation rods over the single segment. And when that is completed, you've got a picture that looks like this. You add the rods, tighten the pedicle uh, screw cap screws, and you've got a four centimeter incision on each side with a very nice anterior column reconstruction, good, good bone graft material and stable fixation. That's what it looks like in the completed state. So the new cell I found uh, useful because among other things, it, it handles well and it gives me a good uh, clinical result. So uh, the bone marrow aspirate that we do adds some uh, 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 allograft, uh, uh, some, uh, some homograft uh, stem cells as well as the amniotic stem cells. And we add that to the bone graft, which is delivered. I showed you this before, this is how we get the bone marrow. We set the bone marrow aside on the back table. We cover it with a drape so that it's not exposed to bright light or heat. And then we do our procedure. And then while we're getting ready to apply the graft, here's how it, how it looks in its uh, unmixed state. There's the, the uh, uh, new cell on the left and the uh, computer has a mind of its own. Uh, new cell on the left, the fibrous, the DBM there in the middle and the bone marrow aspirate on the right side. The applicator is on the far right. So we, we decant off the serum from the bone marrow aspirate. We add the amniotic stem cells to the bone graft, add the bone marrow mix. You get a very nice, healthy looking graft material here and it compresses and packs well into the disc space. We fill this applicator with that material and then inject it into the disc space through the annulotomy that we've created for our discectomy. The graft is injected. Uh, I put a syringe full in from the left and a syringe full in from the right. And at the completion of the procedure, you get something that looks like this. Here's a 12 month post-op look at one of these spot lift procedures. Here's the CT scan demonstrating what I believe to be very nice interbody union of the fusion. I've got a few other cases to show. Uh, bear in mind, these are uh, sort of community orthopedic cases that we have. 
and uh, I don't have anything quite as glorious as the as the uh, complex cases you showed in your conference, but here's standard uh, spondylolisthesis cases. Uh, you mentioned, Dr. Chapman, about peak cages. I was using peak cages when we started doing this work, and this is a peak uh, cage interbody fusion. And you can see that at two years, that bone healing has progressed very nicely. Here's a patient with a uh, uh, failed laminectomy and degenerative scoliosis, a lot of uh, bone on bone at L3-4 and L4-5. And I have been doing a lot of lateral surgery. This is a lateral two level with percutaneous pedicle screws posteriorly. I don't open the patients in the back. I just put in the uh, lateral interbody cages. Again, in 2021, I'm using expandable titanium cages, uh, which have saved a lot of trouble for me. And I'll show you some more of that in a minute. Here is... Uh, Another case using the same bone graft material, this patient had adjacent segment degeneration following a C5-6 fusion. And that's the uh, uh, ACDF cage at C5-6 and C4, uh, sorry, at C6-7 and C4-5. And at uh, a year post-op, you see a good consolidation of that fusion. Another degenerative scoliosis patient uh, for lateral interbody fusion. This is a three level lateral interbody fusion. You can see the one year post op x ray. We're getting nice consolidation of the bone graft in the lumen of the cages. Here's a spondylolisthesis. Uh, with the uh, old peak cages, I was getting some subsidence, as you see on this x ray. It fused nicely, but the cage subsided a little bit. Now that I'm using the expandable cages, we don't have that problem so much because we're not passing uh, five or six different passes into the disc space. It's only just one pass of the, uh, of the cage. You expand the cage to fill the space and it's much less likely to groove the uh, end plate apophysis. Here is another spondylolisthesis case. Uh, this is again the spot lift one year postoperatively. This here's what a patient who had had a BMP fusion by lateral technique uh, several years prior, and now the adjacent segment is completely deteriorated. So in this case, we're going to again go do a lateral, but it's a single level lateral above this uh, this fusion. You can see how BMP leaves this sort of streaky, pale bone information there. And that's the, the hallmark of the BMP fusion is that appearance of bone. It, it's, it's pretty robust bone, but it looks a little different than standard bone fusion. Here we are two years postoperatively with the new cell and the bone marrow aspirate, creating a nice column of well ossified and consolidated bone. Um, I've got a couple of more cases, but I don't wanna bore you with just looking at my cases. Uh, I want to add that uh, we have had uh, good luck with the uh, uh, BM bone marrow aspirate and the uh, uh, new cell bone graft. Uh, I, I encourage you in your research work uh, to try and help us wade through the swamp of uh, multiple uh, biological uh, bone graft supplements and see if we can come up with some good clinical uh, support for one product superiority over others. Right now, we don't have that. I would also add to those of you who have um, uh, fellowship, uh, you're completing your fellowship. If you're looking for a job, I have a great spine job for you in California. Please reach out to me. We have uh, probably the best spine job in all of California to come and do our, uh, our work here. Finally, uh, with the new cell, it has, uh, uh, it's easy to handle. It doesn't involve transmission of, uh, you don't have to hand it off to, uh, to a syringe, uh, sorry, to a, a centrifuge. Uh, it's just very simple to handle. It makes a nice uh, slurry that packs well into the cage and into the disc space. And uh, I wish you uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, thanks for allowing me to speak and I uh, invite any questions you might have. So thank you, Dr. Sharp, and happy St. Patrick's Day to you again, and uh, please accept our virtual applause. My hands and the microphone will uh, serve as a surrogate. 
So uh, I'm impressed with your craftsmanship. You obviously are a very good surgeon, very detail-oriented. I have two very critical questions. We only have about uh, four minutes time. So uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately just obsessed with asking difficult questions. So this amniotic fluid, uh, this amniotic substance obviously has a lot of mystique to it. One is stem cells. How can one substance with amniotic cells do two completely contrary things? One being anti-adhesion mechanisms, and the second one being bone healing, where bone healing is contingent upon forming these microfibrillary networks that basically uh, create an adhesive environment for cell migration, cell population. So these mesoblasts that basically can, can get attached there. So how can uh, this amniotic cell material uh, do two such counter things? Uh, I may have been unclear in my presentation. The new shield is an amniotic membrane. It's acellular. There's no cells. It's just a sheet of amniotic chorionic tissue. And uh, we know from human biology that the, 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 the amnion is, is relatively immune, uh, uh, immune um, inert. And this dry tissue simply forms an adhesion barrier uh, by... Uh, uh, by uh, it, 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 in fact, acts contrary to the inflammatory process. The stem cells generate uh, a bone by their pluripotential effect. And I think that's how uh, the, the new cell works. So the new shield is the barrier. It's acellular. It doesn't have any cells involved. There's no cellular activity to it. The new cell material is the bone graft substitute. So they're two different products, two different functions. I knew they had two different products and I'm notoriously slow on the uptake as all of our fellows can attest to. They always need to explain everything to me twice. So thank you for that extra explanation. Um, how am I, so I, I sit on an implant committee for uh, Providence St. Joseph's. How can I differentiate the uh, potentially beneficial effects of this product uh, from the multi uh, uh, um, variable bone graft that you're creating out of BMA, maybe local bone graft added, then a DBM, and then this additional product. So, so how am I supposed to say this was this product that put this over the edge? You ask the million dollar question. I don't have an answer to you. I think that's why I think our literature is somewhat deficient in the ability to create good clinical research on these matters. And uh, I invite you at, uh, at uh, Swedish Neuroscience Institute to undertake that challenge. We've got so many products, which ones bring value to the patient, which ones are just an added expense. I can't say and tell you with high scientific validity that I have uh, stumbled on the answer here because I don't have the science to back up what I've showed you. But I have done hundreds and hundreds of cases with this material and I've had a very, very happy result with, I think I've had two pseudarthroses in all the cases I've done with this stuff. So I really don't have any major problems with it. And it's a formula that works for me. I'm like many other orthopedic surgeons in the community. We, we ride the wave uh, that succeeds for us. So we're sort of like surfers. We ride the wave that works for you until the next wave comes along. Right now I'm using all of this quite happily and with good success. And that's uh, all, unfortunately, all I, can, all I can tell you about. One very contentious, totally off-label thought. Uh, could such an amniotic um, tissue membrane um, applied to the cord, not the dura itself, have a beneficial effect for non-penetrating cord injuries? Just thinking way outside of the box. Our good friend, Dr. Jeff Kaplan, asked that question. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can the uh, membrane... Kaplan thought of, can amniotic cells, with, which have some stem cells in there, uh, could they have a benefit for spinal cord injury patients, non-penetrating spinal cord injury patients? That's a great question. I believe they're doing some work on that in Israel. Uh, I don't know uh, the latest on the, uh, on the, on the research, uh, but uh, that's a... Very important question, and hopefully in our lifetime, we'll be able to see some progress on it. So we thank you for uh, not just a, a wonderful presentation with uh, nicely done cases, but also uh, your sage commentary um, uh, through our challenging cases. These are all 
uh, cases that were just uh, done in the or being done as we're going on on call. So uh, this is something that we're being challenged with quite a bit, the healing impaired population. Thank you again for joining us and uh, working through the tech problems. And uh, thank you to all our attendees from around the world for their comments throughout and their interest in our programming of the Stead Talks. And ha happy St. Patrick's Day for wherever you are. Take care. Thank you all.